Having a vaginal delivery for multiples is not always the first thought for expectant moms, but it can have its advantages. If you do decide you would prefer a vaginal delivery for your twins, how can you prepare for it? And how is it different from a singleton delivery? I'm Dr. Tevi Tith of the San Diego Perinatal Center, here to discuss how you can prepare for a vaginal birth for your twins. This is Twin Talks. The ultrasound shows your babies to be healthy. What? Did you say babies? You're huge. Are you having twins? Are they natural? Which one do you like better? Twins, huh? My neighbor's cousin's brother's uncle's a twin. So can they read each other's minds? How do you tell them apart? Twins? You got a two for one. Do twins run in your family? Double trouble. You're not having any more, are you? At least you're not Octomom. If you're pregnant with twins or you're an experienced twin parent, odds are you've heard it all before. Now it's time to hear from the experts. This is Twin Talks, Parenting Times 2. Well, welcome to Twin Talks, broadcasting from the Birth Education Center of San Diego. Twin Talks is your weekly online, on-the-go support group for expecting and new parents of twins. I'm your host, Christine Stewart Fitzgerald. Have you heard about the Twin Talks Club? Our members get bonus content after each new show, plus special giveaways and discounts. Subscribe to our monthly Twin Talks newsletter and learn about the latest episodes available. And another way for you to stay connected is by downloading our free Twin Talks app, and it's available for most smartphones. Well, before we get started, uh, let's introduce our panelists and everyone who's here in the studio. And I'll introduce myself. I'm Christine Stewart Fitzgerald. And I've got almost five-year-old identical girls. And um, they're headed off to uh, kindergarten soon. So um, I'm excited. And then I do have (laughs) a 20-month-old singleton who is now officially weaned and on her own. So I'm I'm very happy. Oh, my goodness. Yay. Yay. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, let's go around and uh, let's see. Sunny, can you tell us about you? Absolutely. Okay. Hey, everyone. I'm Sunny. I'm the owner of New Mommy Media, which produces Twin Talks, Parent Savers, Preggy Pals, and The Boob Group. And um, I am a twin mommy as well. Um, I actually have four children, though. My oldest is four, um, and that's a boy. And my middle guy is two. And then I have identical twin girls who are now seven and a half months. I wow. Think. Yeah. Time flies. Yeah, full house. <laughs> I'm Shelly. I'm a high school history teacher and I'm also the producer here at Twin Talks. I have two children, identical twin boys who are going to be two next month. Um, and I'm currently pregnant with my third, just one this time though. Um, we're expecting a girl. So I wanted to give you guys a little heads up about our virtual panelist program. If you're not able to join us here in the studio, you can follow along at home. You can follow us on Facebook or Twitter with Twin Talks. Or you can use the hashtag TwinTalksVP to be a panelist from the comfort of your own home. All right. And today we have a question from Annie in Newport, Rhode Island. She's asking about solid food. She says, my eight-month-old fraternal boys, they seem to be doing you know fairly well in trying new foods. I give them a lot of mushed up vegetables and mix in some fruit. But lately, I've noticed that one of my boys seems to be much pickier than the other and refuses the food I'm offering. So how do I handle this? Do I need to prepare different food for each of them? Hey, Annie, this is Natalie Diaz, author of What to Do When You're Having To and founder of Twiniversity.com and Multiplicity Magazine. Just so you know, you are not alone on your frustrations with solid feeding your twins. It's very common that one twin will have a preference of the foods that they like while the other one kind of, I always call the other one Frank the Tank. I don't know if I'm the only one who saw the movie Old School, but that's that's what I think of. There's always going to be, usually, I shouldn't say always, there's usually one child who's the better eater. So how do we overcome this? Do you need to have two separate meals? It depends. You know, if one kid is totally going on strike and wants to eat nothing but sweet potatoes and they're really just giving you a lot of problems, you may have to, but... I'm going to tell you, old school mom style, even now to this day, my nine-year-olds know that we should we have a rule in our house, that this house isn't a diner. You eat what's on the table, and uh, that's that. Not saying you should apply this rule for your eight-month-old, but I am saying that you got to figure out a way that they're going to eat what they have. So I wish they knew specifically what foods they were eating. Do they not want to eat meat? Do they not want to eat veg? Do they not want to eat fruit? If it's a problem that they want to stay with the sweet, just gradually mix in some vegetables and go, you know, 90% fruit, 10% vegetable. And the next day, go 20% vegetable. Did I say that right? Well, you know what I mean. Just gradually increase the amount of vegetables that are in the fruit until you're getting a nice 50-50. If that doesn't seem to be working and you do feel comfortable with having two separate bowls for your 20s, then, of course, go ahead and do that. 
feeding kids and parenting twins, it's not a one-size-fits-all. You have to do whatever you feel is best for your twins. If you think that it's an issue with texture, let's say they don't want to eat chunky or something, you may want to speak to your pediatrician about it. That's, you should always speak to your pediatrician if you really have a concern. But as far as having the picky eater, you could just have a picky eater. You know, not, not every twin will just eat what's ever put in front of them. So try tomorrow. Start a little bit. Do a lot of fruit, a little veg. Try to change that. Try to give them what they want, alternating with something that they don't want. So let's say you blended up some chicken soup, and then they love having mashed pears. Give them one spoon of the chicken soup, one spoon of the mashed pears. You could even keep it in separate bowls. Um, try that. See how it goes. And you know there's actually a ton of resources on Twiniversity.com in regards to feeding your multiples. So you may want to check that out. There's a lot more specific, you know, questions and answers up there. But I'm sure if you get back to the new mommy media team with a follow-up, I'd be more than happy to help whenever and whenever you need me. So have a good day. Take a deep breath and try not to get frustrated. If you get frustrated, the babies will sense that and they're going to shut down and they're going to shut their little mouth. So take a deep breath, put on some great music, and just make eating time fun time. Good luck. I hope today everybody eats everything that's in that dish. Bye-bye. Today's topic is uh, preparing for a vaginal birth, and today we're talking with Dr. Tevi Tith, um, who's here to help us understand what an expectant twin mom needs to know to plan for a vaginal delivery of her baby. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, I know you see a lot of uh, twin moms um, in your practice, mm -hmm, um, and, and if um, she decides, she says, you know, hey, I really would like to, to try for a vaginal birth, what makes her a good candidate um, to, to try for that? There are definitely several things that make her an excellent candidate. Um, the first thing we always have to consider is her safety as well as the safety of the, the babies. Mm -hmm. um, so like I tell all my moms, uh, baby A always determines um, which way the party goes. So first and foremost is um, baby A is uh, head down. The second thing is really to figure out which uh, what kind of twins they are. So if they don't share a sac, that's also the best kind of twins to have vaginally. Um, we ideally would like for the, the twins to be at least th three plus pounds each. So 1,500 grams is usually our cutoff for um, having twins vaginally. Um, we don't want for there to be a discrepancy in the size of the twins. So hopefully tw they're about the same size. Um, anything over 20, 15 to 20% makes it a little bit more unsafe, particularly if baby B is the bigger one. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, uh, if they've had a vaginal birth before, that's just a bonus, but it's not necessary. So those are the, the most important things in determining um, having a vag whether or not it's safe to have a vaginal delivery for mm -hmm. twins. Mm -hmm. and, and it sounds like these are this is mostly uh, factors about the babies themselves and then on mm -hmm. for the the mom mm -hmm. um, on the maternal health side of it um, are there anything um, that relates to I mean either her health I mean like if if you know let's say if she's overweight or does that yeah. make a difference? So or? we use the same criteria for even a singleton mom. So if she's had a prior vaginal delivery, if it's in a um, if it's in a horizontal direction, she could potentially be a candidate for a trial of labor for twins. Mm -hmm. I've done that before. Um, if she's had a C-section in a different direction, then she may not be. So it's the same criteria that you would use for singletons. Um, if she has certain cardiac or pulmonary problems, um, then she may she may not be a candidate just for her own health. Um, so th we would, again, use just similar criteria that we would use so for twins. What about those common complications, I guess, like we have preeclampsia or gestational diabetes, mm -hmm. the things that are more common with mm -hmm. twins? How do those affect her likelihood of being able to deliver vaginally? Again, generally, um, our success rate is usually the same for both, um, for um, gestational diabetes or for um, somebody who is who has preeclampsia. But um, for somebody who has preeclampsia, for instance, you have to make sure that the safety of the mom is ensured. And with preeclampsia, cure is the the cure for preeclampsia is delivery. So if you don't think you can expedite a delivery of twin pregnancies in a 
you know, in, in a quick fashion, then you may have to do, she, she would really be a candidate for a C-section instead. Mm-hmm. So, And then, I mean, is there, you know, anything that a mom can do during her pregnancy? She says, okay, you know, I'd really like to have, you know, a vaginal delivery. Is there anything that she can prepare for on, I don't know, health wise for herself? (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, just, just like with a singleton pregnancy, we want to encourage mom to, um, increase her, her caloric intake. So what's recommended for singletons is, um, above baseline about 300 calories a day Mm -hmm. for twins it's probably more along the lines of of three to five hundred extra calories a day um and again that's not empty calories you have to be healthy um (laughs) i know look i remember eating lots of protein (laughs) (laughs) yes exactly um and then just educating and counseling patients um extensively about nutrition, um, keeping stress levels low. So there are some positive things that, that, you know, we can do if we said, hey, we'd really like to have that. That's great. Now, um, just in in making that decision, I mean, let's say um, a mom has um, really said, well, you know, I'd I'd like to have a vaginal delivery, Mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. What are some of the the pros and cons of, of each delivery type? Well, looking at it from a maternal aspect first, um, definitely the the pros of a, of having a or the advantages of having a vaginal delivery include um, shorter hospital stays, um, uh, typically fewer problems with anesthesia, so fewer anesthetic complications. Um, usually, it's it's less of a blood loss if everything goes very well. Um, there are some studies that have looked at breastfeeding initiation rates uh, being higher after a vaginal delivery, but when you look at it downstream, t- three months, 12 months down the line, there isn't really a difference between C-section and vaginal, but um, initiation rates appear to be a little bit higher. And, and that means that's uh, basically starting breastfeeding yeah. immediately after yeah, birth. Yeah, exactly. Okay, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So that um, so the moms who have the twins vaginally might have a better success rate of, of getting the starting, baby starting yeah. to, to breastfeed and what, and I think that's probably one of the most critical mm-hmm. time periods mm-hmm. as far, in, definitely the, breast the, the immediate uh, postpartum bonding experience so yeah um, from a, some of the disadvantages obviously you know there's always a small risk of conversion to a c-section for mm-hmm. for patients who start vaginally or who and um, who have a planned vaginal delivery first and then it ends up getting converted to a c-section for usually for fetal indications mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and when they are con- converted i have also heard of in some cases where um, a woman is able to deliver one vaginally and then for some reason, the second one yeah. is in a position or something Something happens where the second one needs to be delivered surgically. How often does that happen? About 4% of the time, give or take. Okay. Um, you know, there was a really large uh, study that was pu- recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this study took over 10 years in many, many countries to participate in. But I'm glad the study was done because it has provided so much good, useful information for us. Um, and it looked at the safety of vaginal twin deliveries versus um, planned C-sections. And they it showed that uh, vaginal deliveries were just as safe as C-sections. I, know, I mean, and that's good to know. So that's something that's that's pretty rare. And I think for women kind of, you know, considering your options, like, well, that's probably not a big likelihood that that would happen. No, but no, it's, it's just something that you would want to remind mom that could possibly is happen. Is there anything that would make it more likely that you could be aware of that would make it more likely that you would have to deliver one each way? Yeah, you know, interestingly, the... Um, uh, in terms of having to convert sort of midway through the delivery, um, the one thing that um, sort of increases that likelihood is um, waiting too much or waiting for too long to deliver the second twin. So um, there are definitely studies that have shown that if you actually um, after the delivery of the first twin immediately go and try to deliver the second twin, your success rates are much higher. And whether that's vaginal or whether that's uh, vertex are doing like a breach extra- extraction. Um, it's actually much more successful if you immediately try to go and deliver the second one. And would that size discrepancy you talked about would that increase the likelihood? 
hopefully you would know that ahead of time, um, you know, with with ultrasound, at least a week within the week of delivery um, so that you could try to prepare yourself um, for that. But um, definitely if twin B is significantly bigger um, than twin A, then that is a definitely a possibility. Mm-hmm. And when you talk about having them delivered within a time frame, I mean, is there a certain time frame? I mean, you know, we've heard of deliveries being within 10 minutes, 45 minutes. I mean, you know. <laughs> Um, you know, it's it's funny. You generally we we say we we'd like to deliver the second twin within an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, some other some other authorities may say within half an hour, but you know I've I've done this before and I I like to have them delivered hopefully within ten minutes of each other. Wow, <laughs> but it's, it's not always possible. It's definitely not always possible, and I've definitely sat there for an hour waiting for the second twin especially Mm -hmm. if the second twin is vertex and the cervix hasn't closed then then i'm happy to give it time Mm -hmm. and to wait for the second one Mm -hmm. so i mean it sounds like there are just a lot of variables in the timing and you know the mom's health and yes i mean i can say in in having done a v-back myself i mean it's it's a lot of work pushing a baby (laughs) (laughs) that's why they call it labor (laughs) well and then what kind of support could you recommend so um we all know with twins there's they have their own plan so um (laughs) even the best laid plans for vaginal delivery don't always go well but is there anything that has been proven to improve chances i mean is there like more support person or other things that she could do you know i i think that definitely having a really good support person is really important in the delivery process um one of the bigger differences in terms of delivering vaginally for twins is um also the fact that you when we push our Um, we usually will push in the operating room instead of the labor room. And usually when you're in the labor room with a singleton, you can have a lot of family around. Um, When you're pushing in the OR, you can really have one other family member around. And it's partly because the ORs are a lot smaller. And if we have to quickly convert to a C-section, for instance, then you would want to just be have to usher one person out instead of a whole family member, instead of a whole family. Um, so that is definitely one um, big difference, but that that support person is is very key, is very integral. But also, um, you know, having the provider explain everything that's going on and who everybody is is really important too, and um, what what um, what processes are. Um, taking place. So for instance, after the delivery of the first one, um, we'll usually do an ultrasound, we'll do an exam, and we'll um, tell mom what we're seeing. And um, if we need her to push or to bear down or something, then she could be a, a, an active part of the, the whole the whole process. Mm-hmm. And so, so some hospitals will let twin moms deliver in a regular labor and delivery room. So that would be, I guess, something to look at when you're choosing your hospital if you wanted to have a support person like a doula or something like that. It sounds like it depends on the so, uh, medical provider. So within yeah. your practice, mm-hmm. that's probably a standard yeah. proce- procedure. And then some hospitals might have different policies yeah. in place. You mm-hmm. have to ask around. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question when it comes to um, the space that's available to do that. So if you are laboring in a OR room, mm-hmm. so I've had two cesareans and one vaginal birth. Mm-hmm. My twins were cesarean, so mm-hmm. this doesn't quite apply to me. But the question would be, I know how valuable like that OR space is. <laughs> <laughs> and you can be in labor. I mean, with my first, I was in labor, which ended up being a vaginal delivery for like 14 hours. Mm-hmm. I mean, nothing crazy. Yeah. Um, so is it oh. fair? I mean... So, so, I mean, how does that work? At what oh. point will they take them in there? Yeah, it's not. Yeah. It's definitely not for the whole labor okay. process at all. No, okay. no, no. It's it's actually just at the very end when once um, they w- reach once, ten, once or they're uh, even once um, even past ten, like once they're mm. starting to push. Once they start to okay. push, then we'll usually bring them to the OR. Okay, but not do, definitely not during the whole labor process because that can take a while. So <laughs> somebody who wanted to have like a doula or another support yeah. person there, they'd still oh, be yeah. able to have that. Oh yeah, the process. yeah, no. Exactly. The, 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 I'm what I'm really referring to is really just that last part, yeah. kind of the last hurrah, before, <laughs> uh, the the marathon before you know the the pushing, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And you know, earlier you talked about the um, position of the babies um, as being one factor of uh, you know the the success of um, you know having a, a vaginal delivery. 
And, um, you know, I, I know I see questions all the time from moms who say, well, you know, I'm I'm 36 weeks and I've got, you know, baby A's head down and baby B is, you know, breech or transverse. And, you know, when are they going to flip? And, um, you know, I mean, how important is that factor? And then, you know, once they do get to labor, if that second baby is not head down, I mean, um, you know, uh, what can uh, be done um, as far as, you know, you know, moving the baby around? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, for having a, a twin vaginal delivery, the the real important part is really just having twin A down. Mm-hmm. Um, because in the end, even if they're both head down, um, after delivery of twin A, baby B can flip. So, so baby B could be head down yep. and then, you know, baby A is born and it's like baby B's like, hey, I've got lots of yeah. space. Yeah. Let's do some flips, <laughs> little gymnastics. Yeah. I'm having fun. Hey, I got a place to myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've definitely seen that happen. I've definitely seen twin B who was breached the entire time suddenly flipped to vertex. So what's most important is really the, the position of twin A. Mm-hmm. And if baby B does flip, then, you know, what type of procedures can be done? Um, There are definitely a couple of different um, options. Uh, Typically, if you if baby B um, has flipped and is now breached, you can actually go in to do a uh, uh, or is either breach or is uh, transverse. You can actually go in to do what we call an internal podalic version. And it just means that you go in and you grab um, one or both feet and you bring it down to the cervix uh, or you bring it out of the vaginal canal and um, deliver baby B breach. Oh, okay. Now, oh, when you say when you're grabbing onto the feet, are we talking about a, a footling um, breach delivery or you're it, just kind of... <laughs> it, 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 it is essentially a, a footling breach. Well, it's, okay. it's essentially a breach delivery. Okay. Um, you grab one foot, the other foot will follow yeah. and um, you will deliver the baby backwards or f- feet first, yeah. um, which they used to do um, all the time, actually, a, a long, long time ago, even for singleton deliveries. Um but presumably, if if baby A has has um, passed through the vaginal canal, um, then they've made space and room. They've paved the way for baby B, and <laughs> and you should be able to deliver baby B. Wow! Wow! Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like that's kind of an, an art form too. I mean, I know in medicine you've got sort of the science, but then it, looking at a situation, you figure, well, <laughs> yes, different you, opportunities. You definitely have to have a provider who's very comfortable with with those types of uh, manipulations, Mm -hmm. um, intrapartum. Um, You also, we we are blessed in that we also have the technology to um, see all of this through ultrasound as well. So I will usually use ultrasound. A lot of providers will use ultrasound um, to help diagnose um, what position the babies are in and then to um, follow uh, and to use their hands to... um, to, to flip the baby. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I think the woman would want to have a discussion about, you know, sort of here's some different scenarios mm-hmm. and, you know, what are what are my options and find out about the provider and their philosophy as well during that, during the, um, you know, prenatal checks. Absolutely. Absolutely. So anybody who um, in our practice uh, is diagnosed with twins and is a candidate for having a vaginal delivery, um, we always have that discussion of mode of delivery. What are we planning on doing uh, when she goes into labor or, um, you know, around the time of her due date? Um, So really, we have to truly counsel the patient and we can't really make a definitive plan until a little bit later when we know where the babies are going to settle. Mm hmm. Well, you know, talking about sort of the, the delivery and actually kind of taking a step back, um, when when moms are, um, you know, just arriving, getting at the hospital from the kind of the, the point of um, active labor, um, how do you approach the delivery process? I mean, you know, from um, a monitoring standpoint, um, you know, frequency of cervical checks. I mean, I mean how much different is it uh, to, you know, give birth to twins um, as opposed to a singleton? What would the moms expect, especially those who maybe they've already had a singleton mm-hmm. birth? Mm-hmm. So if they come in in labor, um, that's usually a good sign and it increases their chance of success. But for the most part, they would come into triage. They would be evaluated for labor. If they're diagnosed with active labor, then they're usually um, admitted uh, to labor and delivery. We 
will monitor the twins um, closely. So the real big difference is uh, monitoring your, um, you've got two of them in there. So a lot of times because of their movement, the monitors just have to be adjusted more frequently. The frequency of the cervical checks aren't um, any different. You still fo- try to follow the same labor curve until the babies deliver. It's pretty much the same, but, <laughs> yes. but you got a little bit more equipment going on here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and when it comes to pain management, um, are there any differences in terms of the pain management and, you know, getting epidurals or any types of other, um, you know, drugs? Um, and, and you know, um, should, should moms be, you know, concerned in any way of, um, you know, what they're um, using for pain management? Uh, no. So the um, pain... Uh, pain management um, is usually managed about the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, we do recommend for moms to get epidurals um, who have who, who where we're planning to have a vaginal delivery of, of twins. A uh, large part of this is really um, for the delivery part or um, in the event that we would have to do something very rapidly. Mm-hmm. So something like an internal podalic version, for instance, is not the most comfortable thing to have to go through. So we would recommend for moms to be comfortable just in case it's something we have to do very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, either that or, uh, you know, again, in cases where we would, in rare instances where we would have to um, convert to a C-section um, rapidly, you would want to have um m- moms at least have um, their epidural, their anesthesia available already. And I think included with that, so when you talk about having an epidural, I mean, I've heard of um, different types. I've heard of a walking epidural as well. Um, is that an option? <laughs> you know, it, it, it is probably uh, options at different, it's probably an option at different hospitals. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that that's probably a discussion that you'd want to um, have with the anesthesiologist to see um, what level they could um, have the block at um, and what options would be available you know twins have to have external fetal monitoring mm-hmm. is that all because I know um, I started with an induction and I know that when you're induced with Pitocin you have to have mm-hmm. both monitors so is that all twin deliveries pretty much is that standard they have to have external fetal monitoring they, sh- they should um, again one of the main risks that we worry about with the twins um, is actually a risk of uh, what we call an abruption where the placenta separates um, prematurely after delivery of the first one. Um, And so a lot of times after you deliver the first one, there's a rapid decompression of the uterus, and that can potentially cause some separation of the placenta and the uterus, which you don't want to have, especially if baby B is not ready to um, deliver yet. So usually we do recommend having um, monitoring during the, during the and delivery. And how common is internal fetal monitoring? So I had, my boy's heartbeats were identical, <laughs> so it was really hard, and they were um, in the same position, very close to each other, so it was really hard for them to ensure two heartbeats on the monitor. So I actually had um, one on an internal and one on an external. Is that common or is that unusual? You definitely can have that, especially with um, uh, if you are dilated enough and um, baby A is uh, well applied to the cervix or um, engaged in the pelvis, you can definitely monitor baby A internally and then baby B externally. That's definitely possible. Is it common or is it kind of not? Um, you know, I, I think the practice is uh, variable with different practitioners. We um, generally try not to put too many instruments um, into the vagina um, because of a theor- an increased ri- potentially an increased risk of infection. Um, if it's necessary, then we will typically do that. Um, so it, I'd, I'd say it, it's uh, provider dependent. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about what you can expect in the labor and delivery or the OR room, who's there, who's helping you out, and uh, what happens. All right. Well, welcome back. Today we're talking with Dr. Tevi Tith, and who's helping us understand um, the vaginal delivery process and who are those medical providers and all the people wearing white coats <laughs> that are in the room. <laughs> we we know in for the moms are doing you know C sections and the OR and there's going to be this whole surgical team. But what about um, when doing a vaginal birth and 
um, we know that there's usually there's can often be a lot of people on the support team. Mm -hmm. Who is that and what do they do? Well, I think the most important support uh, team that you have will be your family or whoever you bring to the labor room with you. They provide support and comfort and encouragement throughout the whole labor process. Um, Another really very integral part of the um, of the team is is your labor and delivery nurse um, and she's really with you the entire time that you're laboring um, she'll explain everything that is going on what sort what medications you have um, or, or what, what medications you need um, she'll give you um, options in terms of uh, pain medications um, and then obviously your doctor who is also there to support you and to to help provide a, a safe delivery um, and then uh, the anesthesiologist is important as well and hopefully you'll be able to meet them um, before you do your or before you have an epidural or um, whatever anesthesia you end up deciding to go with um, and then after the delivery there well really before the delivery while you're pushing there's usually a, a larger birthday party that it, that comes to the delivery room um, a large part of who comes is dependent on the gestational age of the babies at delivery. So if we anticipate that the babies are less than 36 weeks and potentially at risk for respiratory problems, we will usually have the ALS team there, which is advanced life support team. And that usually consists of a nurse and a respiratory technician. And if there's two, you two babies, you have to multiply everything by two. Oh, yes. <laughs> so um, so there's usually a lot of uh, people who are there, and then there's usually um, ancillary uh, staff that help to circulate or to um, um, just help out the team with whatever they need. And so for moms, if you've got a, a big crowd of people there, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you tell them? Just, you know, dim the lights as much as you can, close your eyes. <laughs> yeah, you know, we actually do, um, you know, when, when we're, uh, when my patients or when we have patients pushing, we will often have the lights dimmed um, just so that we can really focus on um, the baby and the mom. Um, most of the time I do warn moms and dads ahead of time that there will be a lot of people coming in right at the end. Um, they're their role is to make sure that the baby transitions safely after the delivery um, and to make sure that the babies are stable. Mm -hmm. And and before they actually get to the the end, I mean, um, during, let's just say, the beginning of active labor to the point where, you know, the mom starts pushing, Mm -hmm. I I know the labor and delivery nurse plays such a major role. I mean, I I know I was in um, active labor for about, uh, let's see, 20 hours. Mm -hmm. And she was my main contact. And uh, I mean, it was, we were in the labor and delivery room for quite a while. And my OB was uh, not called in till, I mean, that, you know, reaching that, you know, 0.0. And so she was calling on the phone and saying, okay, you know, we're at, you know, eight centimeters dilated. And here's, here's all the stats. And you know, giving giving the updates and yeah, and it, she is their main liaison to the rest of the uh, team. So she again um, is your is a is a very good source of support. Um, but she is also a part of the medical team, so she ensures your safety. She um, is typically the one who also uh, performs the checks. Um, the, the cervical exams and will uh, adjust the medications accordingly. Um, she also makes sure that the doctors get there on time to and and um, has has the right personnel around for your babies. I mean that's great that she's she is really the ringmaster, <laughs> <laughs> making everything happen. But it is important to note that um, in in her role she's she's managing all these different aspects from the. Um, let's see, let's see the medical provider mm-hmm. side. Um, now, as a mom, I think one thing I learned is that um, I really could have benefited from a doula mm-hmm. because, um, the, I mean, the doula's role is really to be the support specifically for the mom in, um, you know, managing pain and, uh, you know, getting into positions that help, you know, mm-hmm. further, you know, the um, opening of the cervix mm-hmm. and descent mm-hmm. and all of all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know I, I was laboring. Um, I had, a, well, an unmedicated labor <laughs> um, during that time. Um, and I was unsuccessful um, with the uh, having a vaginal delivery, um, but I look back and I think, oh my gosh, I really, I think that was probably the one thing that I could have benefited mm-hmm. from is having 
uh, someone in the room who had knowledge of kind of helping me get into position, but mm-hmm. maybe a better position for mm-hmm. dissent. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's really important to understand some of the different roles that people play and not expect uh, folks to. Yeah, you know, so <laughs> this came up recently. Um, I also a labor. I was an active labor for about probably about the same time you were, mm-hmm. um, and. I my cervix ended up swelling. I got stuck at six centimeters, and I just never progressed. Um, but in looking back at the labor process, I don't think. I mean, I, like I said, I don't think I would have been able to move much at all. And it was definitely. I mean, the swelling was a concern, and that. But um, you know, we talked about. I, I had my husband there. I had my mom there. I had my aunties there. All these very supportive people. Um, I had an amazing labor and delivery nurse. So I felt very emotionally supported but I think that that what a lot of people forget is that your mom and your husband and your aunt they're not trained in positioning right um techniques etc and and while my husband's very supportive he knows absolutely nothing about childbirth and (laughs) and not for lack I mean he went to every class with me he read the books I asked him to read I mean he's very supportive and engaged in the process but it was something that it, it didn't occur to me um, to have that extra person there who could have helped with a with it in a twin delivery. Let's talk logistics for a moment. So, um, you know, when we're in the hospital room and we're having the delivery, what's actually happening? You know, I mean, we, you know, where there's let's say we give birth to baby A successfully and then sh- there's this time period where (laughs) we're waiting it's like well wait a minute we have a one baby and then what do we do with that baby and then the mom needs to push the other baby and I think you said we've got ultrasound so how does that all work (laughs) (laughs) so so after delivery of baby a usually baby a um as long as baby a is stable dad can actually can actually hold baby a and dad can actually do skin to skin with baby a if he wanted to mm-hmm. um if mom is still pushing and dad wants to be supportive for mom then the nurses can actually help take care of baby a while um while mom is pushing you know again depending on the position of the baby and um you know, if baby B has, or rather, depending on the position of baby B, depending on if baby B is flipped or not, hopefully the time interval is less than 30 minutes to an hour to deliver baby B. And hopefully, as long, and really, as long as baby B is stable and your um, the heart rate is reassuring and mom's vitals are reassuring, then we can allow labor to progress. Occasionally, if the contractions have spaced out, we might give mom a little bit of extra medication to help um, increase the frequency of contractions to expedite the the delivery of baby B so that the cervix doesn't close or so that um, um, the placenta doesn't separate, um, you know, just to make sure that we deliver uh, baby B vaginally successfully. Oh, that's great. So, and that's, I guess, another thing that we'd want to talk to our provider about sort of thinking ahead and planning, you know, what are, what are my options? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, I think when you tell people that you're planning on a vaginal birth or that you want an unmedicated birth with twins, everyone just kind of rolls their eyes. And Right. Um, but I think that the more you can do to prepare, the better. But with still the understanding that even the best laid plans with two babies can kind of go awry. So what do you say to the moms who are saying, I really, really, really want a vaginal delivery? <laughs> I I think it's a it's. It's great to want, and I think um, that it's. Imp- but but I also think it's important to realize that for the safety of both mom and baby, things, um, you know, and and for things that are that happen unexpectedly in labor, that it's always a possibility that we may have to go the other route. Mm-hmm. So I I do tell them that ahead of time. I think mm-hmm. it's kind of hard because you don't want to discourage moms at all from attempting a vaginal absolutely. delivery, absolutely, um, I, or be like a downer. Yeah, like this is a great plan that you have, but good luck. You know, yeah. I think it's kind of a. I mean, it is kind of a fine line because I wouldn't say they didn't warn me. You know, it's mm-hmm. not that I wasn't aware. It was more like. I just figured if I did A, B, C, A, and D, then everything would go fine. Mm-hmm. 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 All right. Well, um, thanks so much to everyone for joining us today. And for more information about preparing for a vaginal delivery or for more information about any of our speakers and panelists, uh, you can visit our episode page on our website. This conversation continues for members of our Twin Talks Club. And after the show, uh, we'll talk with Dr. Tith about how uh, moms can find providers who are very supportive of vaginal deliveries. So for more information about the Twin Talks Club, visit our website, TwinTalks.com.
We have a comment from one of our listeners that we want to share with you guys before we wrap up today's show. And it comes from Amanda, one of our Facebook friends. And Amanda says, I am so glad to have just found this podcast. I found out I was pregnant in February and I discovered Preggy Pals. And for those of you who don't know, Preggy Pals is our sister show all about pregnancy. She says, and I've been listening to Preggy Pals constantly. I just found out tonight about Twin Talks and I couldn't be more thrilled because we're having twins. Can't wait to get through all those episodes of great twin info thank you so much for creating a podcast just for twin moms well amanda thank you so much for listening to our show and please spread the word for those of you guys that are listening to the show if the show has helped you please tell other twin parents about it um, we're starting to grow and that's fantastic but um, word of mouth is always the best way for people to find out um, about resources like ours so spread the word we would really appreciate it and thanks so much amanda for the comment That wraps up our show for today. We appreciate you listening to Twin Talks. Don't forget to check out our sister show, Preggy Pals for Expecting Parents, and our show, The Boob Group, for moms who breastfeed their babies. And Parent Savers, it's your parenting resource on the go. So next week, we're going to be talking about preparing for a cesarean birth. This is Twin Talks, parenting times two. This has been a new mommy media production. The information and material contained in this episode are presented for educational purposes only. Statements and opinions expressed in this episode are not necessarily those of New Mommy Media and should not be considered facts. While such information and materials are believed to be accurate, it is not intended to replace or substitute for professional medical advice or care, and should not be used for diagnosing or treating health care problem or disease or prescribing any medication. If you have questions or concerns regarding your physical or mental health or the health of your baby, Please seek assistance from a qualified health care provider. New Mommy Media is expanding our lineup of shows for new and expecting parents. If you have an idea for a new series, or if you're a business or organization interested in joining our network of shows through a co-branded podcast, visit newmommymedia.com. Hey, mamas. Don't forget to check out Mighty Moms. It's our online community built for new moms just like you. Not only can you connect with other moms, but you can also join us backstage for special mom-only online events. And you'll also be notified when we're recording so you can join us as a special guest. Visit our website, newmommymedia.com, and click on the Mighty Moms banner. It's free. That's newmommymedia.com. See you there.